Concern over Kenya. The government reassures travellers, but the cancellations continue. What next for a country so dependent on tourism? The Somalia issue is an international problem. We need an international solution. Also on this week's programme, the hotel booking website that claims to know all the best deals and the first Facebook hotel in Ibiza. That's online check-in later in the show. And we take a look at the impact of holidaymakers on hundreds of whale sharks off the coast of Mexico. Hello, I'm Fiona Foster. Welcome to Fast Track. Kenya is a country whose economy and whose people are heavily reliant on its income from tourism. But the recent attacks on tourists by Somali pirates are casting a long shadow over its white sand beaches. Two months ago, with the high season just around the corner, hopes were high for Kenya's tourism industry. Last year, it brought in a record 1.1 million holidaymakers and $800 million, and Kenya was confident of improving on those figures. If you look at uh, year on year from uh, 2008, uh, we've made some very positive gains. Uh, we were hoping to close the year uh, with around 1.2 to 1.5 million international arrivals. Uh, that then, uh, complemented by the domestic arrivals, would put us in the region of about 2 million. So that's uh, the projection that we had for the year. But that potential has been threatened by the recent murder by Somali pirates of a British tourist, David Tebbett, the abduction of his wife, Judith, and then three weeks later, the kidnapping of a French woman, Marie de Dieu, from beachfront resorts on Kenya's northern coast. Lamu, a UNESCO World Heritage Site described as the oldest and best preserved Swahili settlement in East Africa, where Marie de Dieu was abducted by an armed gang, has been worst hit by the drop-off in visitors. It derives up to 90% of its income from tourists, which has led to demonstrations by locals whose livelihood is under threat. For the particular region, which is Lamu, yes, there has been uh, some cancellations and uh, there's been uh, a slowdown in new bookings, uh, especially for the high season. Uh, and this has uh, a lot to do with the, with the travel advisories that were issued by the, the, the French government, uh, the British government, and the US government. So that discouraged uh, a few bookings to come through. Tourists we spoke to at Nairobi airport were planning to avoid the coast near the Somali border. When we heard about the abduction of the British couple out of their hotel room, and a friend of ours who also diverted their plan, Salamu, we decided maybe to be on the safer side and maybe go south. When we live in Israel and uh, you hear in the BBC that something bad happens, we don't necessarily feel it, I mean, because it's a large country and uh, life must go on. We we're not going to the coast and staying well away from Somalia, so we think we'll be fine. Britain is Kenya's biggest tourist market. TUI, the British travel operator which takes 11,000 people to Kenya every year, flies only to Mombasa in the south of the country and has so far seen few cancellations of those who've booked. But they have noticed that some holidaymakers yet to book are choosing to go elsewhere instead. We have had some drop-off in, in holidays from Kenya but it hasn't been dramatic and probably not as much as some people would imagine because most customers who book with us realize that when they go on holiday with us to Kenya, it's hundreds of miles away. It's a five hour drive away from where the tragic incidents have occurred and it's a very different part of the country. For a country like Kenya, which relies so much on its tourist revenues to help pay for vital services like healthcare and education, communicating a safe image is crucial. 
Kenya scores quite well on the tourism dimension of our study in terms of attractions and places to visit and heritage and culture. Some of the things that perhaps are associated with its long history as a, a destination for game reserves and safaris and also has great beaches and so on, on, on particularly on the, uh, on the Indian Ocean. Um, the truth is that country brand strength is about more than tourism. It's about perceptions of whether a place is safe whether a place has a stable political system um, and how its people are treated and its value systems. And decisions to visit are as much informed by those aspects as they are by whether there's a great lodge to go and stay while you're on safari. Kenya's Minister for Tourism says the government has now put in place what it calls robust security measures to keep tourists safe. We have done our part. We have put security teams and security networks everywhere. We have now collaborated with the community to give us intelligence, as well as we have appealed for international support. So if these three, uh, uh, these three uh, items are brought together, I believe there will be a permanent solution. This is not the first time that Kenya has seen its image as an idyllic holiday destination tarnished. Visitor numbers fell off sharply in the wake of post-election violence back in 2008. In the aftermath, hoteliers found themselves with practically empty hotels. Immediately after the crisis, we had quite large-scale major cancellations immediately. And as a result, business levels dropped. Uh, uh, I would say between 60 to 70 percent. I lost almost everything. For about six to seven months, we operated with nothing, literally no client coming. This time, the problem is different, an external rather than an internal one. Kenya is paying the price for the instability in neighboring Somalia. In the last week, there's been an incursion by Kenyan troops over the border in what the government says is a mission to pursue the Islamist militant group it believes are behind the recent abductions. As the weather improves, there have been concerns that there could be further attacks by boat. Today, the Somali problem has become a Kenyan problem. We have become victims and we are losing. The Somalia issue is an international problem. We need an international solution. I therefore appeal to the international community and the UN that we need to stabilize Somalia. We need to make sure we eradicate terrorism and uh, criminal groups. We need to facilitate the neighboring countries so they can be able to address these issues. Mike Macharia is hopeful that with a coordinated international effort, the situation can be improved. And he's trying to be positive about the long-term effects of the recent terrible events on Kenyan tourism. You get uh, immediate bad publicity, uh, which is not a good thing. However, uh, it's publicity. So you need to now uh, show the world that you move from that step and Kenya is safe and uh, we start the recovery process, particularly for Lamu, and, and, and try and encourage more people to come out and see for themselves that it is safe. One of the things we've noticed actually is that there's sometimes a paradoxical relationship between um, what might be perceived as negative events and then brand awareness and perceptions. Sometimes when something goes wrong, simply being in the public eye can help to improve scores because it improves awareness of the country overall. Well, what do you think? As usual, we'd love to hear from you. Have you recently cancelled a holiday to Kenya? Or maybe you were planning to go and have changed your mind? Or perhaps you're sufficiently reassured that you're going to go ahead with your trip anyway. Do let us know. Our email address is fasttrack at bbc.com. And many of you were in touch about our recent story on Boeing's Dreamliner. Tito Patterson from London says he believes the industry will have to decide between Airbus's massive A380 and Boeing's much smaller Dreamliner. He says... Do you run more scheduled flights because the Dreamliner is faster and more fuel efficient? Or do Airbus have the right idea by deciding to carry more passengers in one go and so scheduling fewer flights? In reality, it's about two rival aircraft manufacturers who've come up with a different solution to the same problem. 
Farrell Kahn from Switzerland emailed us to say he's worried about the claims made by Boeing that flying in their new Dreamliner will be a less pressurised, more comfortable experience. He says... Although there'll be 5% more oxygen on board, and one suspects passengers will feel better on arrival, because of this there could be a temptation to keep them on board for longer. Therefore this could lead to more incidents of flight-related DVT. But perhaps we should leave the last word to a viewer from Dubai, who said that at the end of the day, the success or failure of the plane will rely on how many it sells and how many people find themselves sitting on one. We're told that eventually 800 of these lighter, fuel-efficient, carbon-composite aircraft could be cruising across our skies. My question is, are we talking about something that's more fuel-efficient or only full-efficient? And thanks for all your emails. Now let's have a look at what else is making the news in the world of travel this week. Qantas has grounded seven planes and cancelled almost 500 flights scheduled for next month. The airline blames a backlog in maintenance work after recent industrial action. Qantas is also facing rolling strikes by ground staff. If you've been hit by cancellations, the airline's Travel Alert webpage offers advice on how to rebook your flight. Japan's tourism ministry is warning people to ignore emails asking them to submit copies of their passports if they want to apply for free flights to the country. The government says the offer hasn't been approved yet and that the emails are from fraudsters. And feeling sleepy? If you're passing through Dubai Airport, you can now catch 40 winks in a sleep pod. The so-called snooze cubes cost $18 an hour and will be linked to flight information boards so you don't miss your plane. Coming up after the break, fancy swimming with sharks? Well, whale sharks. We look at the impact of whale shark tourism in the waters off Mexico.